of herd opinion um, it, just by a click, but also it produces a huge opportunity for people like me who are um, data hungry and, and uh, uh, in love with data like this. And um, that brings the advent of computational pathology well and truly um, as a kind of assistive tool, but also as a mechanism for discovery of new patterns, for deep learning of known histological motifs and patterns, but also for deep mining of unknown histological patterns in a systematic data-driven manner, whereas previously those patterns might have been picked up by uh, pathologists getting together in Lyon and going over some of the existing evidence and, and trying to work out what might be um, you know, new patterns that, that, uh, uh, that pathologists should know about and getting them into the WHO blue books. Uh, I'm now quite confident um, that, that some of these new discovered patterns by computational pathology, i.e. the application of AI machine learning algorithms to cellular pathology, uh, is now going to be able to uh, uh, help with discovering new patterns that can hopefully one day make their way into WHO Blue Books as well. Now, for me, this is not new at all. Um, I organized this uh, computational pathology session. We call it computational histopathology special session or CHIP at ISBI, International Symposium for Biomedical Imaging together with my colleagues, Tim Kemper from Bielefeld University in Germany and Martin Gurken from Ohio State University and now at Wake Forest in the US, um, back in 2008. And uh, this was a half day session. We organized um, this session together with uh, the symposium, ISPI, um, and we accepted six talks, um, the title of these six talks and uh, the affiliation of uh, uh, people who were involved in those six papers, um, you, you might be able to read. And some of them are still working in this area, particularly uh, colleagues like Anant Madhavushi, who was recently moved to Emory University in the US, and Martin uh, Gurkha himself. Um, and there's a lot of work on multiplex imaging, which was in its infancy at the time. Even digital pathology was in its infancy at that time. Um, but I think. We've come a long, long way in the last 15 years, and now um, there isn't probably any pathology meeting, including PATSOC annual meeting and the European Congress of Pathology and the ASCAP that's going on this week, uh, where there is no mention of digital, and now increasingly, where there is no mention of uh, computational algorithms, AI, deep learning algorithms, and their application to cellular pathology and increasingly more and more interesting and uh, somewhat novel problems in those areas as well. All right, so in our group, we have been looking at these problems for over 15 years. Um, and our approach is that we like to think of uh, these images consisting of tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of nuclei of different cell types that, that are coming together, whose spatial relationships and individual entities can then inform us about the contents of those images. Uh, they can inform us about uh, the patterns that might be present in these images, and they can help us predict uh, some sort of tasks that, that we are uh, interested in and our colleagues are interested in. So um, I see it as a kind of chasm between two camps in the area of computational pathology, one that uh, professes the use of end-to-end -end machine learning, um, and I'll explain in a minute what that means, and the other that uses uh, mostly bottom-up machine learning, which is our group. Most of the time, we are working on algorithms that go bottom-up, starting from recognizing every single nucleus and then building uh, some sort of histological features, trying to understand morphology, architecture, generic wider patterns, spatial relationships, and build our features uh, at the slide level and the case level from those from population data. So the end-to-end -end machine learning framework works generally like this, that you have a bunch of whole slide images, and they are given a label at the slide level, either tumor, normal, or good prognosis, bad prognosis, for instance, 
are responder, non-responder, or they have a mutation, or they don't. And all of that is chucked into a machine learning algorithm, um, increasingly deep learning algorithm, that uh, then decides uh, where in those images the interesting and important patterns might be that might be related to some of those labels towards the right-hand side. So the approach that we have taken in our group, as I said, is more bottom-up machine learning. And here what we do is we start with recognizing, segmenting, detecting, classifying primitives, um, all the way down to nuclei, sometimes looking at sub nuclear structures if we have detailed uh, information about them, for example, in multiplex images or multi-IHC data. And then uh, looking at regions, recognizing various different kinds of objects like your uh, vessels, nerves, uh, glandular structures, and recognizing various different kinds of patches. And patch is a very small, tiny part of the entire full slide image. And then building local statistics on the back of those primitives, regions, and patches that we have recognized, and uh, turning those into um, I'm sorry, my PowerPoint seems to be acting up a little bit. Uh, okay, there we go. And then building uh, at slide level or case level statistics and scores from those local statistics for the purpose of diagnosis, prognosis, or prediction of outcome and uh, response and such. Now there is uh, another, uh, so, so this bottom up uh, approach allows learning and mining of interpretable features in my, opinion. I think it's uh, pretty powerful in that sense. And increasingly, there is a focus on development of AI that is interpretable. And then there's another paradigm that's emerging that combines these two paradigms uh, that I call the top-down machine learning, um, which starts all the way from the top, uh, recognizing areas of interest, and then drills deeper into those areas of interest using bottom-up machine learning. OK. So I will just very quickly go over some of the algorithms that we have been developing in our group uh, following that bottom-up uh, uh, paradigm and a little bit about the uh, top-down paradigm as well. Um, and then I'll talk about a few applications of those algorithms and then finally coming to a case report. Okay, so here is uh, one quite popular algorithm. Uh, lots of different groups are using it uh, by the name of PowerNet. Um, and without going into technical details, uh, this network uh, recognizes different types of nuclei, nuclei of different types of cells, um, and segments them, put, puts a contour around them as well. And as you can see here, um, it's able to recognize the malignant uh, or dysplastic epithelial cells, the normal epithelial cells, fibroblasts, inflammatory cells, uh, muscles, endothelial cells, and um, just put everything else in the miscellaneous basket. No, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that it's all uh, uh, perfect and the problem is solved. This is actually quite a hard problem, not least because all these nuclei look quite different, but also because between different labs uh, on different days, stained by different people, these images can appear to be quite different. And sometimes it's quite difficult even for our pathologists who have been helping us doing the annotations for you know, putting contours around these nuclei uh, to be able to tell where one nucleus uh, stops and the other one starts, because particularly for the malignant epithelial cells, it's really, really difficult to delineate the boundaries of those nuclei. Nevertheless, we thought it's, it's an important problem and um, we need to make a start. So this algorithm was published back in uh, 2019 and, and has been uh, taken up uh, by uh, quite a lot of groups. And, and now we're actually um, in the process of uh, making it better. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, another variant of this algorithm, which is, uh, I think, much more powerful than this one. Um, the other one is along the same lines, the detection of mitotic cells. And this is another important problem in breast cancer grading in several other cancers. Um, you're asked to count mitotic figures um, in a certain number of high power fields. 
And uh, this was a contest that was held in the back of 2021 by the name of MeDog, um, mitosis domain generalization. And it's exactly tackling that problem that I just mentioned about the inability of some of these deep learning algorithms to be able to adopt and generalize to uh, data from other centers, from other labs. So a lot of times we have seen that algorithms are trained on data from a number of centers, but as soon as they're taken to data from an unseen center, uh, they uh, often fail quite badly. So this contest was organized by colleagues in Germany, mainly. Um, to tackle this issue, but particularly for the problem of mitotic cell detection. And this is just an overview of the approach that was taken by our group um, to begin with uh, stain normalization, to standardize the stain appearance of the given image, and then segment the candidates after the stain normalization, uh, refine those candidates, um, and then finally, uh, pinpoint exactly where those mitos mitotic figures are. So, all right, uh, that's the repetition. So both in MeDog 2021 and MeDog 2022, um, this algorithm that I just uh, gave you an overview of uh, was declared as the winner of both of those contests uh, two years in a row. And this was uh, all uh, a result of uh, hard work of uh, a team from the TIA Center, led by Mustafa Jhanifer, who is one of our PhD students. Um, Simon Graham uh, also developed uh, this algorithm for gland segmentation in colon uh, resections, uh, colorectal cancer resections, uh, back in 2018 as part of his uh, PhD in our group. Um, and without, again, going into technical details, what this algorithm does is it puts a, a contour around the glandular objects um, and it worked pretty well uh, even for uh, malignant glands, glands that are completely deformed and, and start completely losing their shape. And more recently, as part of his postdoc work with us, Simon has led the development. This was a work of a large team, including several pathologists, uh, where we've actually brought all of these pieces together, the segmentation uh, classification of different types of nuclei, as well as segmentation of glands and segmentation of lumen and uh, classification of various different tissue types, all of them in one model that we call the Cerberus model. That's this multi-headed kind of monster that does all of these different tasks uh, using a single backbone network. Um, and this is quite powerful in my view because, first of all, it saves a lot of time. Uh, you don't need to process your uh, same image uh, through different networks to perform all these different tasks that can be brought together for the final interpretation of the contents of the image and to help with the prediction of whatever task it is that we are trying to predict. It also uh, uh, allows us to uh, pick and choose which of these tasks and, and the information coming from these tasks might be of uh, benefit to us and, and take those further. So a little bit about some of the work that has been going on in some of the other groups. And this is uh, probably one of the first of the, the biggest papers coming in the area of computational pathology in JAMA towards the uh, tail end of 2017. Uh, led by uh, Jeroen van der Lock's group in uh, Radboun Medical Center in the Netherlands. Um, that was, our group was involved in this competition that they organized by the name of Chameleon, and this was the result of that competition for uh, detection of lymph node metastases uh, in uh, female breast cancer. Um, and I was also, uh, two days before this paper was published, I was also the PhD examiner of the uh, first author um, in, in the Netherlands. So what was a really key uh, result of this paper was that um, pathologists uh, without time constraint could compete with the AI algorithms, but pathologists with time constraint, the AI algorithms actually did better. Um, and what was even more interesting was that when the pathologists were combined uh, with the results of the AI algorithm, i.e. they were shown the results of the AI algorithm, and you might say that they might have been a little bit biased by 
seeing the results. But nevertheless, um, the, the the performance of the com combination of uh, AI and human was uh, the best, um, and I think that's where that's where we're heading. So, so this paper was quite seminal, uh, remains quite seminal, and has opened the floodgates of uh, several companies coming into the fore, uh, attacking this particular problem on lymph node metastasis detection in breast cancer and indeed in other cancers as well, but also. Um, uh, you know, it, it's um, uh, it's also given us impetus for uh, lots of interesting research with the help of deep learning algorithms, because um, this was the first major uh, uh, kind of milestone that showed that these algorithms can be taken into the clinic. And then this paper that came out um, in 2019 from the Memorial Sloan Catering Group, uh, showed that uh, actually you could do prostate uh, a tumor detection in prostate biopsies with high degree of accuracy using the end-to-end -end learning kind of approach. Um, and there was quite a bold statement made in this paper that uh, you need at least 10,000 whole slide images um, to be able to do a good job for uh, uh, solving this kind of problem, tumor detection in prostate biopsies and other types of biopsies as well. Um, and, and um, the caveat here is that uh, that number applies to this kind of approach, the weekly supervised approach, the end-to-end -end approach that only looks at um, just the uh, uh, slide level labels. But actually now there are um, other methods that do not require such huge amount of data. Obviously, the more the merrier is what I always say to my pathologist colleagues when they ask me how many slides we need to develop an algorithm. But I think uh, you know increasingly there are now algorithms that are not that data hungry that are more data efficient, so to speak. All right, so so all that is really interesting for diagnostics, um, but can we do something in helping with the understanding of the tumor microenvironment, which is obviously quite a hot topic in the area of cancer research, because uh, we know that there is not just the formation of tumor. Uh, that uh, uh, happens on its own just by tumor cells uh, growing and, and increasing in numbers, there needs to be uh, a kind of rich and fertile soil for the tumor to develop. And by the same token, there needs to be a, a good uh, immune environment for the tumor not to develop uh, for the arrest of the tumor. So uh, this is also quite important from the point of view of uh, therapy because now, increasingly, there are uh, immunotherapy regimes that are coming up for various different kinds of cancers uh, and have shown tremendous success, although um, it's still very new and, and we're only beginning to understand why um, those work and, and for which group of patients those work and, and how to avoid uh, some of the, uh, the really serious kind of side effects of those regimes as well. But I really believe that the approach that, uh, that, that I termed as the, the, the bottom-up machine learning uh, lends itself quite nicely to the profiling of this histology landscape, to the coloring of this histology landscape, um, to the deepest level at the cell nucleus level, um, and being able to then uh, profile the tumor microenvironment and to better understand the state of play for selecting optimal treatment. So um, in that can context, we have been looking at uh, various different problems for various different cancers and trying to understand the tumor microenvironment and trying to come up with digital markers of tumor microenvironment that could help predict the, uh, uh, the, the response to a particular kind of therapy, but also that could help stratify patients into low risk and high risk groups. So the first example I'm going to give is one that has just come out in the Journal of Pathology uh, last month uh, for triple negative breast cancer. Uh, this is the work of our PhD student, Rawan, uh, together with uh, my very dear colleague, uh, Professor Jane Arms, who is a professor of pathology trained in the UK, but now uh, working in uh, Australia, uh, and Dini Graham, uh, who's based at the West Mead Institute in Sydney. And here we looked at uh, the tumor associated stroma markers as well as the stromal tail markers. And we showed that the exact same markers could be uh, uh, 
uh, translated from one cohort, the Australian breast cancer cohort, which is already a multicentric cohort from Australia, more than 300 cases. Um, and uh, those markers could be taken to the TCGA breast cancer, the triple negative breast cancer group, which is just over 100 cases uh, on the TCGA, the cancer genome at plus multicentric US based cohort. And we showed cross validation. Uh, the same markers trained on TCGA worked on the Australian breast cancer cohort and vice versa. So that was quite nice to see, but also it shows that, um, you know, there is something in the tumor associated stroma. It's not just about tumor again, it's about the immune response. Uh, the stromal tails are uh, kind of uh, uh, indicative of the immune response and they can help us stratify patients into low risk and high risk groups. Another thing that I'm really, really interested in is predicting response to immunotherapy. This is a joint work with uh, David Cunningham's group at the ICR um, in London, uh, led by uh, Dang Wu, one of our PhD students, uh, co supervised by myself and uh, Sean Raza, who's one of our uh, uh, associate professors in the TIA Center. And here, again, by this deep profiling, building all kinds of features, a whole library of features, hundreds of different kinds of features, bottom up, uh, we showed that uh, histological features, digital histological features um, that are built from these uh, kind of uh, neighborhood spatial arrangement and density-based uh, measures, they can uh, predict better the response to immunotherapy in inoperable esophagogastric adenocarcinoma. Uh, granted a small cohort of about 100 cases, now uh, we've got access to much larger cohort, multicentric one on the back of a trial that has been going on in the UK, run by David Cunningham. Um, and we are uh, replicating these results. And in fact, we've got a little bit better results now. But the interesting thing here is that um, the histological features, the digital histological features actually do a much better job in terms of prediction of response to immunotherapy as compared to the molecular only features. These are kind of your go-to features, the tumor mutation burden and the expression of PDL1. Um, and, and to me, that's, that's quite exciting. All right, um, so coming back to the TILs, the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, this is a joint work with um, Professor Ali Kuram's group at Sheffield, where we were looking at uh, a cohort from Pakistan to begin with. Um, and this work was done by Muhammad Shaban, who is now uh, was a PhD student in our group, now a postdoc at the Harvard Medical School. And here we were looking at the abundance of tails and literally trying to quanti quantitatively uh, measure the abundance of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes in the tumor microenvironment, in the tumor itself, uh, the bulk of tumor. So we begin with uh, obviously the whole slide image. And then in the whole slide image, we have areas that are only tumor, areas that are only lymphocytes, um, such as these. And then uh, we came up with a measure that can help us quantify the abundance of tails, um, as in literally lymphocytes who are penetrating into the tumor and are co-localizing with the tumor. So uh, this is how it looks like, just an example, the whole slide image overlaid with the sea of uh, green and blue, green being tumor, uh, sorry, green and red, green being tumor and red being uh, lymphocytes, and then finding areas where these overlap and putting those in terms of hot spots like that. Uh, so you see hot spots of tails all over the place, and we can quantify each of these little uh, tissue fragment and we can say, what's the till abundance score for this tissue fragment and for every single tissue fragment. And we can also aggregate these statistics at the slide level or at the case level. And we can use that for stratification of patients into low risk and high risk groups. So for this cohort from the Shokut Khanum uh, Hospital in Pakistan, together with colleagues um, at the pathology department and the clinical trials department there, uh, we put together this uh, framework and um, for that cohort, we showed that it works pretty well. Um, and those numbers were small, this was a pilot. So what we then did was we reached out to colleagues in the UK um, and got hold of another cohort on the back of another MRC funded project led by Hisham Mahena at Birmingham. Um, and we uh, tinkered with the score a little bit 
and we came up with another score. This was originally um, Ali Kuram's idea. And we showed that uh, the score for tumor associated stroma infiltrating lymphocytes. So these are lymphocytes that are surrounding the, uh, the stroma in the tumor, uh, stroma around the tumor. And uh, we showed that that actually does an even better job on not only uh, the cohort from Pakistan, but also the cohort from the UK um, in head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. And another interesting thing that we found here was that uh, the number that we uh, gleaned out of these images, the, the digital classil score, had good positive correlation with CD8 positive T cells. That shouldn't come as a surprise and strong negative correlation with M0 macrophages. Staying on with um, Ali Kuram, my dear friend and, and colleague, um, we have recently um, uh, got some really exciting results on the uh, prediction of malignant transformation. And this is uh, Saad Bashir's work um, coming to the end of his PhD. Um, and, and we have a couple of other really exciting results by um, other colleagues in the group as well. Um, and, and um, in this one, we are uh, looking at the grading of uh, oral epithelial dysplasia, and we're showing how they could be uh, uh, automatically graded and how, if at all, we could predict the malignant transformation of this dysplasia. And here is one really interesting example, um, and the revision of this paper uh, is now under review um, at uh, um, a journal. And here we showed that uh, from these HNE biopsies of the dysplasia, we could predict recurrence grade and progression. And this is a low grade case that actually ended up transforming. And what we found was really interesting that the lymphocytes on the periphery of the epithelium, actually when you quantify them, they can uh, uh, predict to a good degree of accuracy malignant transformation. And we call them PELs, the periepithelial lymphocytes, uh, so watch out for this paper, hopefully coming up soon. Um, and then staying with uh, Ali Kuram again, prediction of uh, HPV status. Um, Ali kept on saying to us that uh, he could see uh, from the HNE images which ones were HPV positive and which ones aren't. Um, so we started working on this project together with uh, Lawrence Young uh, from uh, Warwick Medical School. And this was led by Rayu Wong, uh, one of our senior PhD students in the TIA Center. And here we showed that you could actually predict the status of HPV with good degree of accuracy um, from the HNE. Okay, so uh, so that's um, all to do with the various different outcomes that we're trying to predict and various different status and staying on with predicting the status of tumor uh, here is another really exciting piece of work that uh, we published towards the back end of uh, 2021 in Lancet Digital Health. And this was the work of uh, led by our postdoc, uh, Mohsin Dinal, on an MRC funded project um, on predicting the status of uh, colorectal cancer pathways, molecular pathways, and key mutations. Okay, so in here, uh, particularly, we looked at MSI microsite like instability because uh, we know there's a lot of evidence to suggest that MSI high cases are more likely to respond to immunotherapy than MSI low cases or uh, proficient MMR cases. So we developed this pipeline for predicting the status of not just MSI, but um, all the four major uh, colorectal cancer pathways. And this was a more uh, of an end-to-end -end or top-down type of approach where we started off with, we don't, nobody could label for us the areas that were corresponding to MSI prediction. Uh, so we went with uh, labels at the slide level uh, that told us uh, that that uh, case was MSI or MSI, uh, MSI high or MSI low. And then picking up those areas that were lighting up from the algorithm, uh, then we dug, dug deeper into those areas and uh, we identified various different kinds of cell composition uh, patterns from those areas, such as intratumor lymphocytic infiltrations, uh, which is known to be associated with microsatellite instability. So that was also quite nice, nice to see that the algorithm was picking up areas that were corresponding to known histological patterns. And recently we have adopted that same algorithm to another one that we call KMEM, 
uh, for colon biopsy screening. And this was part of uh, a, a major project that uh, just concluded uh, under Park Lake, um, together with David Sneed and colleagues at uh, Coventry and Warwickshire Trust. And here, uh, the adoption of that algorithm, the uh, variant of that algorithm, uh, actually showed quite good performance for separating normal from abnormal biopsies. And in abnormal here, we're looking at both neoplastic and non-neoplastic. And on, on the left, bottom left, you're seeing three cases that are uh, hyperplastic polyp, adenocarcinoma, and hybrid dysplasia. Uh, and uh, the algorithm picks up the areas of abnormality quite nicely as well. Um, and then more recently, uh, we have developed this uh, framework that is a more genetic framework, even though we started off with applying it to colon biopsy screening by the name of Iguana. You can see that we have a liking for reptiles uh, for interpretable AI in computational pathology. And I think it's, it's quite important that we have algorithms that can uh, be built on and that can be explained away with features that are uh, interpretable by not just any human, by the domain experts, in this case, histopathologists, uh, to boost the confidence of histopathologists for taking up these algorithms, that it's not just a black box where images go in and results come out. You can actually see exactly which bits of the image contributed to the prediction and why those bits were contributing to the prediction. A lot of these algorithms, not all of them, we have packaged together in the form of uh, what we call TIA toolbox. Uh, and if you're interested, it's all uh, publicly available, open source, completely permissive. You can take this one toolbox in Python and, and you can uh, uh, make use of some of these algorithms and experiment with them on your own. All right, so just very quickly, um, I will talk about, um, I will list uh, a number of challenges that still remain in the area of computational pathology without going into uh, details of any of them in the interest of time. I'll just pick on a couple. I'll say that uh, the algorithms may be biased. If the data is biased, the algorithms are biased. If the data is coming from, for instance, uh, you know, very imbalanced distribution of uh, ethnicity or gender, age, then the algorithms might be biased towards those factors as well. Um, and some of these algorithms, a lot of these algorithms are not necessarily terribly robust. They can be quite fragile. So we still have a lot of work to do, uh, but we have interesting uh, uh, new findings to build on. And we have now increasingly more and more applications coming into the fore. So I'm going to jump to the case report now after listing all of these challenges that I don't have time to go into. Um, and this is the first uh, for me presenting a case report. Um, and let's see how it goes. All right. So the case is this one. It's, uh, it's taken from TCGA. So for all the cases, almost all the cases on the cancer genome atlas, there is a histopathologist report appropriately deducted the names of patients, obviously details of patients and the names of signing pathologists redacted appropriately. Okay, so this one is a case which was pre-op diagnosis was right colon neoplasm, post-op diagnosis is the same type of procedure was hand-assisted laparoscopy right colectomy. Okay, so a lot of details here about the dimensions, cross dimensions, and so on. And this was a three-page report. So the second page tells something about the diagnosis, uh, summarizes the diagnosis, right colon, right colectomy, and gives some more details of the uh, specimen. Uh, this is a synoptic report. And here's the histological type, adenocarcinoma, grade, high grade, poorly differentiated, to undifferentiated and perineural invasion, invasion not found, uh, lymphatic invasion not found, and so on. Okay, so this three-page pathology report, I did an interesting experiment. Uh, I'm not a pathologist, so I'm not in a position to present to you the case. So I just fed that report to Chat GPT, the latest revolution in AI. And I said, can you summarize the following pathology report from a pathologist's point of view in plain English terms? And I copy pasted the text from those three pages into chat GPT. And here is the almost immediate answer. 
It said the pathology report describes the result of an examination specimen obtained from right hemicolectomy. Uh, the tumor was located in the cecum. Here's the measurement of the tumor. It was identified as a high grade, poorly differentiated to undifferentiated adenocarcinoma with a mucinous tumor component 15%, no evidence of lymphatic invasion, perineural invasion, or tumor deposits. And trust me, I didn't teach it anything. I just copy pasted that report into chat GPT and asked this question, this one here in the first two lines. The lymph nodes examined, it told, tells you the number of lymph nodes that were examined showed no evidence of metastasis. There was mild to moderate lymphocytic response, no intertumor lymphocytic response. It also said that micro satellite instability test report was pending. Then I found the MSI report. And that's the addendum report. So then I said, here is the addendum report. Can you combine the following additional information and describe the result, results to the patient in lay terms? So this is the MSI test report, which shows that all the MMR markers were present, and hence the case was not deficient in MMR. So this is the result. It says, um, the additional information in the pathology report states that DNA mismatch repair test was performed to assess microsatellite instability. The test showed no deficiency in the DNA mismatch repair proteins. This means the likelihood that the cancer is due to Lynch syndrome or other DNA mismatch repair defects is very low. However, the test may not detect rare mutations in the proteins up to 10% of the cases. The tests used for clinical purposes have not been approved by, approved by FDA. Disclaimer. All right. So then I went one step further. I said, can you summarize the above set of results to the patient's oncologist and their gastroenterologist? So now it went a bit more technical in its description of those results uh, to the oncologist and their gastroenterologist. And you can see some similarities to what we've seen before, but also a bit more technical uh, in the way of what the report were fo reports found, okay? So again, um, no lymph node presence, uh, no positive lymph nodes, uh, DNA mismatch repair testing showed intact DNA mismatch repair function, and so on. And then I said, all right, let me ask, uh, what therapeutic options can be offered to this patient? And then it said, well, it depends on the st stage of the cancer, which is determined by the extent of the cancer spread. And this patient's cancer appears to be at an early stage and here are the potential treatment options. And here is the first major mistake that it made. It says surgical resection. Well, obviously surgical resection in this case has already happened. Um, but then it talked about adjuvant chemotherapy, radiation therapy, um, targeted therapy, immunotherapy. So not bad answers, right? And then I said, okay, well, how about combining adjuvant chemotherapy with immunotherapy? Would that be a good option for this patient? And say, so, well, it starts with a disclaimer always and ends with a disclaimer. Uh, it depends on several factors, but the, the factors are, are not nonsensical. Stage of cancer, patient's overall health, other individual factors. Then he said, uh, unclear if adjuvant chemotherapy would be necessary or recommended for this patient. Why? Because the cancer is not spread to nearby lymph node. Immunotherapy generally not used as first-line treatment. And then I said, okay, well, that's interesting. Let me ask it a bit more about immunotherapy. I said, well, isn't immunotherapy a good option for early stage colorectal adenocarcinoma? It then re-emphasized the fact that immunotherapy is not typically used as first-line treatment. And he said, it's usually recommended for patients with certain high-risk factors, such as microsatellite instability or high tumor, tumor mutation burden. Okay. Then I said, all right, let me test it one step further. I said, but I heard that the results of niche trials showed that neoadjuvant immunotherapy for early stage colorectal cancer can be beneficial. And this was test on chat GPT-4, which was just released yesterday. And then that model recognized, it said, oh yeah, you're right. There were promising results for neoadjuvant immunotherapy in a subset of early stage colorectal cancer patients in that trial, spelled out that trial for me as well, the niche trial. And he said, the study focused on patients with early stage MSI high uh, deficient MMR colorectal cancer, which makes up small proportion of all early stage colorectal cancer cases. 
And then it said, um, well, uh, yeah, and it found, that study found significant pathological response in patients with MSI high DMMR early stage colorectal cancer. So great. And then it said, yes, um, early stage colorectal cancer, that is MSS or has proficient mismatch repair. Uh, surgery and adjuvant chemo, which is this case, uh, remain the standard treatment. So, okay, um, some um, good information there. And then finally, again, a disclaimer, important to discuss these options. All right, so then I wanted to ask this one final question. Uh, can an AI test be beneficial for this patient? I so, said, well, there are various AI-based tests that can be potentially beneficial, such as genomic tests that use machine learning algorithms to analyze the patient tumor DNA, predict the likelihood of recurrence or response. Some AI algorithms can detect subtle changes in medical images. And I said, okay, well, I asked a very generic question about AI. Well, can you suggest any AI test based on digital pathology images? And I said, um, I am just a model. I cannot suggest specific tests, but I can provide some general information on AI tools that may be useful. For example, tumor segmentation and classification tool, assessment of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, that may have implication for prognosis and response to immunotherapy, prediction of molecular characteristics that may predict molecular markers or genetic mutations, prognosis scoring, treatment response prediction. And then finally, again, a disclaimer, essential to cons uh, consult with the treating healthcare professionals. And I had to finish with this. I said, well, should GPT, chat GPT, be used for consultation for therapeutic options? And then it, it took all the responsibility off. I don't want to take any responsibility. No, it's not a substitute for qualified healthcare provider, only a licensed healthcare professional who has access to patients' complete medical history, imaging studies, laboratory tests can provide personalized recommendations for diagnosis, treatment, management, should not be used, chat tips should not be used as a substitute for medical advice or consultation. So I think that's a very nice conclusion to end at. Um, so I'm going to uh, end there, and actually in line with that, um, I'm going to reassure my pathologist colleagues that AI is not here to replace you. AI is here to assist you, to help you understand, quantify, uh, and, and diagnose and treat disease better, hopefully. Um, and, and people who are scared of it, I would say it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent. AI may be more intelligent in some cases. It's the one that is most adoptable change. Change is on the way. So it's up to us if we embrace it or not. And with that, uh, I would like to thank all our amazing team. Um, this is a dated photo, but a lot of these people are still with us and all the funders and the patients whose data we use. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Nasa. That was a really fantastic lecture. Thank you, very interesting indeed. I'm sure it's thrown up a lot of questions. Can I remind the audience that if you have questions, uh, please can you put your questions in the Q&A box uh, and I will read them out uh, for Nasa to answer. Uh, whilst we're waiting for people to type in their questions, uh, perhaps I could start. Um, could I t take you back to the study you mentioned on oral dysplasia when you were talking about the algorithm identifying lymphocytes at the periphery of the lesion, uh, predicting uh, with quite quite a quite a, uh, a, a strong value, uh, predicting invasion of these lesions. How does that work? Why why would why do you think lymphocytes at the periphery of the lesion are so important in that regard? I can see Ali Kurum in the audience. I'm not sure if he can speak up to that, but I know um, I've been taught by him that these lymphocytes are there for a reason. They may be the beginning of an immune response to potential malignant transformation. And um, that's all I can say. Uh, I'm sure Ali can explain it much better than I can. But these very early days, as I said, this is mint work that we have um, just sent back to um, a journal that most of you are familiar with. And um, hopefully, if it gets accepted, it should be out in the public domain within the next uh, few weeks. Um, and, and there are some more details there. 
but all I can say at the moment is that uh, the, the presence of those lymphocytes in the periphery of epithelium could be, um, uh, you know, those lymphocytes sensing uh, that there might be something uh, afoot um, and not necessarily, um, you know, visible in terms of grading. So that, that sample was graded low, but it ended up uh, transforming um, into uh, invasive uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure that's that's a very interesting finding. I'm sure it will throw up further studies as well to to, to characterise what the lymphocytes are and what they're doing. So I'm sure that's a very interesting observation. Um, okay, so we do have a question in the Q and A box. This is from Gregory Vachese, who says, "Do you think bottom up algorithms that often rely on annotations are scalable?" and robust enough for clinical CPATH systems? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so scalability of those annotations, those algorithms, if what is meant by that is if we take them to new tissue, new cancers, new types of nuclei, I think that's very much an open problem at the moment. I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like I said before that these this is a solved problem, nothing to be done, um, we can go ahead and apply these algorithms to all kinds of pathologies, all kinds of tissue. Uh, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done, but I am still a proponent of bottom-up machine learning paradigm for uh, a computational pathology because I think the additional value that they provide to us is um, remarkable, and I think uh, that's going to help us by the pathologist's confidence and, and uh, that's going to help us uh, with adoption of AI algorithms as well. I think um, the, the second part of the question, the uh, robustness for clinical uh, computational pathology systems, uh, again, is, is uh, an open question. Uh, we take it uh, one tissue, one pathology at a time. Um, I think it would be amazing if there's a magic bullet out there that can work for all tissues and all pathologies, but I'm not aware of any such thing at the moment. Uh, and I think uh, this is going to be work in progress for a little while at least. Okay, great. Thank you. So next question is, is from your good friend and collaborator, Ali Karam, who says, great talk, NASA. Why do you think such a small number of AI tools are making it into routine diagnostic clinical practice, despite all the promise? Also, are there other data sets such as the TCGA that people can use, i.e. PathLake for everyone? Yeah, absolutely. Both great questions. Um, I think Ali knows the answer to both of those questions, but um, <laughs> for the interest of uh, the rest of the audience, um, you know, the, the first part of the question, why there are so few of the AI tools available in the market? Well, uh, increasingly there are more and more, if you go to PATSAC meeting, ECP, ASCAP uh, that is going on this week, you will see loads of tools um, that, that are being demonstrated. I think the uh, the bottlenecks are, uh, you know, uh, one on the technical side and the other one on the regulatory side. Of course, these tools can't just be handed over to people to start to use for their routine diagnostic purposes. There needs to be due diligence, uh, multicentric validation, which is um, not a mean feat. Takes time, takes a lot of money, uh, takes a lot of effort um, and, and patience. Um, so those are uh, some of the uh, challenges. On the technical side, there is still a challenge of the robustness and generalization and transparency of these algorithms, which um, I think it is going to be, uh, uh, you know, th they are going to be some of the major uh, research problems. And, and I'm sure they are being looked at by uh, business entities that are uh, that are selling these products. So. So hopefully not not too long um, to wait, Ali, for for you and and, and colleagues like you. Um, you should have these AI algorithms, some of these at least, at your disposal to be able to uh, analyze the tissue better. Hopefully. Okay. Thank you. Question about data sets. Um, yes, Pathlake is meant to be publicly available, and we are in the process of 
making that publicly available hopefully later this year um, colleagues will be able to use path lake data sets as well that's good news thank you uh, so the next question is from jonathan kell who asks all the work presented is in solid organ histology is there any work in hematology blood films and marrow aspirates or fluid samples generally where relations between cells are not fixed yeah, there is some work that I'm aware of uh, coming from Oxford, uh, Jens Ritzker's group, um, Daniel Ryson, I think, um, and, and also Sirino Kunwatana, one of our former PhD students now based in Oxford. They are working on bone marrow. We did a little bit of work in bone marrow a long time ago, um, but um, I think there's a lot of work now happening in uh, uh, bone marrow and other hematological disorders. Uh, but we haven't done much work on that. So ours is mostly on solid tumors. Yes. Okay. Uh, so next question from Emery, who says, since chat GPT-4 is a multimodal LLM that can take both text and vis visual inputs, do you envisage a type of co-pilot AI for pathologists in the near future that works like a colleague? And if so, how would you envision it to work? Yeah, that's a great question. The reason why I started looking into ChatGPT for that case report, I wanted to see what could be gleaned out of the text. But absolutely, I mean, if ChatGPT can make use of pathology images, well, then um, we might get in trouble because <laughs> our main core business um, in terms of the TIA Center and the spin out that I've just uh, uh, started uh, is on um, uh, you know, analyzing these images and, and pulling out data. But the reason why I presented that example was exa exactly with that scenario in mind, that if we put the images and the text and also other pieces of information together, then, you know, we, we can do a better job of uh, understanding the disease, profiling the disease. Um, and, and certainly there is a possibility like that as a co-pilot. Um, in fact, there are now tools, um, regulatory approved tools that are being rolled out in the NHS as part of Pathway Plus, um, as, as we know, um, that you will hear about soon, that are acting as a co-pilot, as a second read. Okay, I think we have time for one final question. Uh, this is from Sarah Aitken who says, great talk, thank you. Some or many departments are now generating digitized slides routinely in NHS tissue pathways. From your experience, what is the best way to make these available to researchers? For example, navigating the consent ethical considerations and bridging NHS versus university IT infrastructure. Yeah, great question again. Um, these may seem to be very low tech problems, um, consent, ethical considerations, but they are obviously extremely important. Uh, they need to be uh, taken care of. Um, what the advice from Patlik uh, Ethics Approval Board um, came back was that you don't necessarily need consent for all of these cases because it's completely anonymized tissue. Um, so that was interesting because we were um, tying ourselves in knots um, that we needed to only take cases that where, where consent existed because this, this is not a clinical trial. A lot of these um, cases that I mentioned that I talked about. Um, so where uh, the consent is not required, the job becomes easier. And then it all depends on, you know, the relationship between the NHS trust and the university and between the IT systems and, and IT personnel of the NHS and the university, how smooth that transaction can be. Um, in Patlik, we have navigated that and, and we have now a system where we have a um, couple of dozen NHS trusts coming in and, and um, transferring their data into the data repository that we are putting together. Um, so we can talk offline. Uh, I can share my experience on that as well. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we've just reached the end of our time. It's just after 10 o'clock and we do have a, a tradition of trying to finish on time when we can. So that just leaves me to thank you once again, uh, Nasser. That was a really interesting talk with some fascinating material which, which you covered. So thank you very much.
thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning uh, and that's all from us so it's been a privilege thank you very much bye thank you and bye